Thank you all for coming, and thanks, Cassie, for the uh, introduction. I'm, a, I'm recovering from a cold, so if, uh, if, I, uh, if you can't hear me, just um, raise your hand, and I'll try and get closer to the microphone and speak up. Um, <clears throat> so um, I want to say this is a really um, cool event, and I'm really um, thankful to Cassie for organizing it. I think it's really exciting that we have um, that Cassie has worked and others have worked so hard to um, revitalize the um, the herbarium. And so it's, it's really um, great to be part of this event today and great to celebrate that really wonderful um, accomplishment. <clears throat> All right, so this top sidebar doesn't appear to be going away, but um, uh, let's see here. So usually, uh, I, can, I, I got it. I think I can just uh, do it. Uh, actually, that is a little weird. <laughs> Give us just a second here, and we can. Um... Can try to exit out. All right, apologies for the technical difficulty, but I think we are now good to go. Um, so I'm going to talk today about, um, about pollination and plant reproduction in um, diverse plant pollinator communities. It looks like it's a little cut off on that left screen, but you can see everything on the right screen here. Um, and this is a, a topic that's really of central interest to, um, to my lab and my, um, and my research group. Um, so I'm going to start off just by talking about what, well, what is pollination and why is it important to um, plants. I think interestingly, this is something that even a lot of biologists are a little bit um, confused on, um, which is which kind of makes it fun to talk about even to a to a mixed um, audience. So really, pollination is a critical step in the reproduction of plants. <clears throat> um, so what I have here is a picture of an apple um, through its development, um, and it's and it's a, just a reminder that every apple starts off as a flower, right? Every strawberry starts off as a flower. Um, and in order to um, produce a fruit and to produce seeds, um, what needs to happen is the male genetic material, the male gametes, um, need to fertilize um, the female ovules in the plant. So this is much like animals, you know, we have a sperm and an egg coming together, um, but in plants we have pollen coming together um, with a, an ovule, which is the plant equivalent of an egg. Um, and when that fertilization happens, that allows for that seed um, to actually develop and for fruit to develop um, as well. So this is a really critical step um, in the reproduction of, of, of essentially all um, flowering plants. Um, and then when we look across this sort of flowering plant um, lineage, um, about 10% of plants that are out there rely on the wind to transfer pollen between flowers. The other 90% of flowering plant species actually rely on um, an animal pollinator to actually carry pollen between flowers to allow that fertilization um, of those flowers to happen. Um, so I hope you got a sense you know, from that previous picture showing the apple of, of why that might be important. Um, but this is really critically important for our agricultural systems. Um, so about a third of the calories that we eat are directly dependent on pollinators um, for that food. So, um, and we have to remember that that takes into account a large proportion of the overall human diet that comes from non-plant um, sources, so meat and dairy and other things. And then uh, as well, um, most grains are wind pollinated, so corn, wheat, rice, um, those grains um, don't require an animal pollinator. But then what we're left with are most of the fruits, um, the nuts, the seeds, many vegetables, so any vegetable that has a seed in it, um, those are dependent on pollinators by and large um, for that um, crop production. So that means that really most of the macronutrients um, in our diet, micro and macronutrients, 
are coming from plants that are dependent on pollinators. So pollinators are, and pollination, really, really important in the human agricultural enterprise. Um, obviously, though, um, as well, when we're thinking about um, pollination as contributing to the reproduction of about 90% of the plant species, flower and plant species on Earth, this also means it's really important for ecosystem functioning more broadly. So I think it's good at a botanical um, research symposium in particular to, to sort of remember that plants are the energetic foundation for all of terrestrial life, right? So this is how we are taking sunlight and converting it into the energy that people use, but all other wildlife uses as well, right? So if we think about that, I think it's a very important thing to remember, um, you know, then having pollinators sort of maintain the reproduction of those plants is, is very, very, very important. So it, it produces this energetic foundation and really allows humans and then all other wildlife um, also to, um, to exist. So that's my little, my little introduction about pollination and its importance. Um, and you've probably all been hearing about pollinator declines and the, the concern going on with those. And what we don't want to have happen is what we're actually seeing in this picture. This is a picture from the UN uh, Food and Agriculture um, Organization, and it's a picture showing people hand-pollinating apple trees in China. Um, so this is happening in some areas where there's been a lot of pesticide, really severe, intensive pesticide use, um, and there really just aren't enough pollinators to make this happen. Um, for these agricultural crops. This is an area where labor is pretty cheap, so they can actually go out and make it work economically, but this really leads to price increases of these, um, of these crops and plants. So this is what we don't want to have happen um, at, a, at a more global um, level, or even at any, at, at any kind of level. Um, so um, just in terms of thinking about pollinator declines in the kind of worst case scenario, this is what we can, we can kind of be thinking about. But I'll switch gears here and start talking a little bit more about what, um, what my lab is involved in, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of understanding um, some of these dynamics around pollination, um, and in particular, multi-species um, systems. So I'm going to very briefly cover two um, research areas that we're, um, we're active in, um, and then really get into a little bit more detail in terms of these plant pollinator um, networks. <coughs> So the first topic is, uh, is the DNA metabarcoding of pollen. So metabarcoding is quite a, quite a mouthful there. Um, but basically what we're talking about is being able to identify pollen using um, the DNA. So using uh, molecular genetic signatures um, of the DNA that are in these pollen grains. Um, so this picture is kind of set up to, sh to give you some idea of some of the diversity of these pollen grain types. But many of them are really, really hard to tell apart underneath the microscope. And in fact, often it's, it's almost impossible, functionally impossible, to distinguish between species, say, within a genus, um, just looking microscopically. And you can kind of tell a lot of these things really just look like spiky balls. Um, you know, so trying to get under the scope and tell them apart is really challenging. Um, but we can do that in a much finer scale way with, um, with the DNA. And in particular, one of the areas that we're very actively involved in right now is trying to be able to do this in a quantitative way. So we can use the DNA, but actually get back, okay, there's 20% you know, apple pollen in this sample, 40% you know, ragweed, I hope not, um, you know, et cetera, but really be able to map those um, proportions back um, to samples, which is challenging, but we're, we are working hard on that. <clears throat> um, another area that we are involved in and related, again, to those pollinator declines is looking at the um, disease ecology and evolution um, in honeybees. So this is work um, that's very collaborative, um, in particular with, with Yap Jarud here from Emory, who many of you heard speak um, earlier in this symposium, um, as well as a couple of folks over at University of Georgia and a collaborator at Berkeley as well. Um, so we're looking at really a, a number of topics related to that general theme, but, but very broadly, um, one of the things that we're very interested in is what happens to the evolution of um, parasites and pathogens of honeybees. When we go from a system that is where honeybees are sort of, you know, where they kind of came from um, in an ecological context. So, say, living in a hollow tree, um, really kind of dispersed far away from, you know, the closest other um, honeybee colony. And we can contrast to that with the way that honeybees are managed nowadays, um, which is very, very different. <laughs> so we are often um, managing thousands of bee colonies really closely together in these huge... Um, apiaries or collections of colonies, 
we're trucking them across the country, so something like two-thirds of all honeybee colonies in the U.S. are trucked out to California to pollinate almonds every year. So it's a kind of mind-boggling scale at which this movement of honeybees happens, a very, um, very large geographic scale. So we're, we're trying to really understand what are the implications of that, again, for the evolution um, of the parasites and pathogens of these honeybees. All right, and then um, I'll jump into the area that I really want to focus in on today, which is um, ecological networks. And this idea is we can look at a community of, uh, at a biological community consisting of a lot of different species and really figure out who is interacting with whom um, in those communities and, and kind of trace those connections and linkages. Um, and in particular, we are interested in what are called mutualistic networks, and these are networks of species that um, benefit one another. Pollination is a very, um, I think, key example of that, but we can look at mutualistic network and other, for other kinds of mutualisms as well. So um, plants and their, the animals that disperse their seeds, um, fish and, and the cleaner fish that actually help clean them, but get meals, um, you know, as a, as a sort of side benefit of doing that. Um, so we can, we can really think very broadly about these mutualistic networks. Um, but in my lab, we are very focused, as unsurprisingly, probably on pollination networks. And these are really the connections between plant species and pollinator species um, in an ecosystem. And one can go out, and this is something that we've done um, extensively, is to go out into an area and really try and enumerate and um, describe what are those linkages, which of these set of pollinating insects in this area is actually interacting with this particular flower, um, et cetera. And when we do that, um, these, are, these are data actually from, um, from Spain and from quite a long time ago now. Um, 12, uh, 13 years ago. Um, but, and, and in this diagram, each of the green circles is a plant species, each of the red squares is a pollinator species. And, and really interestingly, when you go out and look at the structure of these connections and ecosystems, they're incredibly consistent for pollination networks. So there's some aspects that are very, very um, consistent, irrespective of the sort of ecosystem that you're looking at, the geography. And you can look at um, pollination networks in Zackenberg, Greenland, so on the northwest coast of Greenland. Um, they share similar patterns to this as do um, networks in, from the Amazon. So it's a really um, kind of cool and intriguing that we see these structural consistencies um, in these networks. Um, and that's something that we're really um, interested in, is sort of, you know, given a, a particular structure, does that structure sort of help these networks um, respond to perturbation, say, more quickly? Um, does it affect the way that these ecosystems um, function? So um, we are very interested in particular in this question about perturbation. So when we have um, more and more perturbations to ecological systems with um, ongoing anthropogenic environmental change, one of those important environmental changes is the loss of species. So we're talking about not just global level extinctions, but also if a um, species goes extinct locally from, from one population. What are the consequences of that? Um, and the consequences in particular for both pollination functioning um, and also for um, looping back to the structure um, of those networks. Um, most of this work we've done in and around the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, which is outside of Crested Butte, um, Colorado. Um, this is really um, difficult and challenging for us. Um, we have to leave um, Georgia every year um, in June and July <laughs> when it's so nice here, nice and warm, and then we have to go to the frigid mountains, um, and it's just, oh, it's awful. There's no humidity there, you know, but, you know, somebody's got to do it. So we step up, we stepped up to this challenge, um, and I've been working at the, at the Rocky Mountain Biologi Biological Laboratory, which we um, call Rumble. Uh, for shorthand um, since I've, I've been at, at Emory, so we'll be um, going to our ninth um, field season um, next summer, um, which is exciting. Um, but um, we've done a whole series of species removal um, experiments there to sort of um, simulate what happens when we have a local um, loss of a species, and we've done this in particular with bumblebees, which are quite um, abundant in this area. I've got a couple um, of vials with individual bumblebees um, in this picture, and, and so what we've done is taken a, a set area, and we've learned to identify the bumblebee species on the wing. We actually capture them with nets. Um, we keep them in these vials for a few hours, and then we look at what's happening with the remaining uh, bees in that system, and also what's happening with the plants as well. Um, so being able to look at plant reproductive uh, pollination outcomes 
um, when we simulate um, extinctions in this way. Um, and here we have a couple of Emory undergrads from actually from our very first field season out there faithfully executing one of these um, species removal um, manipulations. And I'll just very briefly mention um, a couple of the results that have come out um, of that work. So um, one is from this um, paper that was in PNAS a few years ago. Um, and basically what we found is that when we did these species removal manipulations, the, the remaining bees um, in the system actually changed their behavior and in particular changed um, a behavioral element that we call floral fidelity. So for plants, it's really important that um, a pollinator sort of sequentially visits different individuals of the same plant species. And when they do that, then they're transferring the right kind of pollen between them, right? So lily pollen doesn't work to pollinate a rose. Um, so they have to be really focused on one plant species in order for pollination to be successful. And what we saw was a real breakdown of that floral fidelity when we simulated um, an extinction. And not only did we lose um, floral fidelity, that also led to reductions in reproductive output um, of these plants. Um, so that was a, a cool finding that, that um, we got out there and um, we followed up on that work by, again, sort of going back to how, you know, if we remove a species from this system, how does that actually affect the structure of those networks? Does it change it in any meaningful way? And we found that it does. So what happens is um, some of these um, species, pollinator species, will start visiting different plant species. And this changes the structure of the network um, very distinctly and, and in ways that probably reduce, um, that are probably negative in terms of um, uh, ecosystem functioning. We weren't able at that time to really tie the type all the way back to the functioning, but certainly in ways that we would think would be consistent with with bad outcomes for function. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so another area that we're um, very interested in in terms of thinking about what might be these um, human-caused perturbations to um, these networks and these systems, another one is um, not just species losses, but climate change. So this is an area where we are, um, we, we've done some pilot work and where we're looking to, to very actively expand um, in the future. Um, so um, one of the, when we're looking or thinking about the ecological impacts of climate change, one of the big concerns has to do with the timing of biological events. And that's what ecologists call phenology. Um, and in particular, there's a lot of concern about um, mismatches in terms of the timing um, between interacting species. So in terms of pollination, you can imagine that if a plant blooms and its pollinator isn't there to pollinate it, that's going to be bad for that, um, for that plant. This is particularly a concern because a lot of species use different kinds of cues from the environment to time their biological events. Um, and in the past, those cues have been very, very correlated. And with climate change, they're becoming less and less correlated. Um, so in our system in Colorado um, and in many uh, montane systems, there's a prediction that we're going to see accelerated snowmelt. Um, and snowmelt is something that we know actually affects when plants bloom, unsurprisingly. Um, and so we think that this acceleration of snowmelt um, may very well change um, the blooming schedule across the entire plant community. And in fact, not only do we think that, there's actually amazing um, observational data at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab for the last 45 years on plant flowering phenology. Um, taken every other day across the entire um, um, season. Um, so those are data from David Inouye, who's now retired from the University of Maryland, but it's, um, these are some of the most important data, actually, in terms of putting together um, this concern about, um, about timing mismatches and that happened in our field site, which is really cool. Um, and, and what we are curious about is, you know, might these changes actually affect the structure and particularly the functioning um, of these networks? Um, so, um, and with that said, there have been some, some cool experiments where people have had this idea and they've, say, accelerated the blooming of one particular plant species, maybe in pots in a greenhouse, and then they bring it out to the field and see what happens. But no one's really done this at, a, at a, the scale of an entire um, community. So what we are doing um, really is experimentally accelerating snowmelt um, and doing that in a bunch of replicated plots across the landscape out in Colorado and doing that with paired controls so we have the same area close by, similar um, plant composition, but that aren't melted out quickly. And we did a pilot um, field experiment on this in 2017 with three sites. <clears throat> we, 
We are intending to scale this experiment up this year, um, but climate change got in the way. So um, last winter, it was actually the second lowest snowfall um, in Colorado um, on record. And so there just wasn't enough snow um, to actually pull this experiment off again last year. So we're hoping that will not be the case again this year. Um, but yeah, let me talk a little bit about what we found from the pilot season. And yeah, first let me show you this visual. And so this is how we're um, actually doing these um, snow melt accelerations, which is that we put black greenhouse shade cloth out um, over these plots that are 10 by 14 meters, so pretty substantial, um, substantially sized plots. And it's a little hard to tell from, from the resolution here, but um, you, know, you can see this, this sort of patch here in the middle is completely um, melted out, whereas the area surrounding um, the fabric has, has not yet melted. So these really speed up um, the snow melt by something like, um, you know, we're aiming for like three weeks of, of sort of acceleration um, in terms of that snow melt. Um, so we are interested in effects both on network structure and also <coughs> excuse me, on pollination functioning. Um, in 2017, we were really just using one um, target plant species, which is a beautiful um, larkspur, um, delphinium, um, a, a pretty close relative of the aconite that was mentioned at the very end of, of Sheila's talk. Um, and um, Loy, who is one of the organizers here of this symposium, did some, some great work um, disentangling you know, if we see changes in reproduction, are those due to pollen limitation, or are those due actually to something like resource limitation? Um, so we'll get into that. Um, so the first result is really that these experiments work. So we definitely sped, sped up flower phenology, so that was cool to see. And similarly, we didn't see any kind of major off-target effects, which is something that you're always worried about with experimental manipulation. So no effects on plant survival, um, growth, or the total production of flowers. Um, we didn't see any effects on network structure, but with only three networks, that would be almost impossible to find. Um, so that, that's not a surprise. Um, contrary to what we thought we would find, we actually found an increase um, in plant reproduction um, in, in this Larkspur and Delphinium Italianum. So um, we have some ideas why we think that might have been the case, but it was a, it was a surprising result. But, um, but hey, we'll, we'll, we will um, take it. And we are going to dig into this. Um, much more next year, assuming that the weather actually cooperates with us this time around. Um, so we're going to expand this out to eight sites. Um, Loy is very um, ambitiously going to tackle lots and lots of different plant species. Um, and we are also very interested um, in measuring traits to understand if there are particular traits of, of insects or particular traits of plants that might um, actually couple with these phenological changes to either buffer these plants, say, from from negative effects or, or exacerbate negative effects. And with that, I will um, wrap up. Thank you guys so much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions.